Well, so good to see everybody this morning. Good morning. How are you guys? Terrific. You guys look good. I heard last week my dad threw me under the bus for iguanas or something like that. Well, that iguana gave me COVID, I think. So, so uh, yeah, that was a bummer. So if I fall over, you'll know why. I'm a little foggy this morning, uh, but yeah, so good to be here this morning. Uh, speaking of foggy, how many of you participated in VBS last week? If you did, would you stand up? Would you stand up? We want to honor you guys. Yep. That is awesome. Thank you so much for investing your time into, uh, into the next generation. And we know it's a lot of work. Um, but yeah, we just wanted to publicly honor you guys. Um, I have some exciting news I want to share with you all before it hits the Instagrams and Facebooks this afternoon. Uh, I guess last week was my first Father's Day because uh, we're expecting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're all very excited, very apprehensive. Uh, all the feels. Uh, baby Goins is due Thanksgiving Day. Pretty cool. Uh, we don't know the gender yet, but... Uh, you know, I've been doing my part, helping around the house, lifting heavy things, eating for two. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sensitive. Solidarity, you know. <laughs> yeah, but seriously, hey, we appreciate your prayers uh, for us, for mom, especially for baby. Um, also, as Andrew uh, said, remember next week we are hosting all of River Valley. Every campus is going to be here. Now, I know we at Redwood love our small church family. Uh, nothing wrong with that. But I know the big crowd is going to be a little uncomfortable, a little chaotic uh, for some of us. It's like when we introverts host a party at our house. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, but sometimes you got to do it. There's too much to celebrate. We have uh, such a good place to host this kind of party. Amen. Amen. And so this is going to be the first time we get to worship all together as uh, all the campuses in one place. So like Andrew said, please carpool if you can, uh, be willing to sit a little closer than you normally would. Uh, we'll be live streaming as well if you want to stay at home, but we're going to pack this place out, uh, not to celebrate our name, not to celebrate River Valley's name or Redwood, but to celebrate the name above all names in this place next week. So we're very, very excited about that. Now, lastly, before we dive into today's teaching, uh, I want to take a moment to pray. Uh, considering the Supreme Court decision on Friday to strike down Roe v. Wade. Uh, I didn't think I'd see it in my lifetime. I don't know about you. Uh, this is something that millions of people have worked for and prayed for for almost 50 years. The killing of the unborn is no longer a constitutional right. And for that, we thank God. And we also know this issue goes back to the state, so there's a lot more work to be done. And the greatest work, of course, isn't in courtrooms or in Congress or on Facebook debates, but it's done in conversations, compassionate conversations. It's done in trying to mitigate the conditions that lead to abortion, supporting single mothers, education, reduction of poverty, supporting adoptive parents. I encourage you all to write a check to Pregnancy Care Center this week. And it's going to take, again, compassionate, persuasive conversations with people who see this issue differently than we do. There's so much pain, have you noticed? Fear, uh, anger swirling in our country right now. And so we do what our master asked of us, we pray. So let's take a moment and do that. Father, we do recognize the fear and pain and brokenness and injustice in our culture. Yes, pertaining to abortion, but broader than that as well. Father, we're in such need of your kindness. So take a moment to thank God for life that we're alive, that we're made in his image. Take a moment to thank God for overturning, for the overturning of Roe versus Wade, a grave injustice in our country. Take a moment to pray for our pregnancy care center in town, that God will continue to provide for and protect them in their life-saving work. Pray that we would be a church, that you and I would be people committed to life from womb to tomb. Take a moment to pray for someone right now who supports abortion, who's grieved and angry this weekend. 
Uh, pray that God would bless that person, would soften their hearts, would soften your heart towards them. Maybe particular names and faces come to mind, friends and family members who see this issue a little differently. Take a moment to pray against the violence and hostility that may come from this ruling. Let's pray for the shalom of God in our city and state and country. And if you know it, would you join me in praying the Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. What a time to be alive, huh? In the book that my dad recommended last week, author Thaddeus Williams tells two stories that read like mere images. The first one is this. Christian Piccolini was a 16-year-old uh, teenager when he joined the Chicago area skinheads. He rose quickly through the ranks to become a leader of the neo-Nazi hate group. I felt abandoned, and that led me to this community. Christian found community fighting against immigrants and people of color. But after the birth of his first, first child, by God's grace, Christian was set free from the sin of white supremacy and went on to lead a new group called Life After Hate. The second story swings to the far left, where we, we meet Connor Barnes. At 18 years old, Barnes was depressed, anxious, and ready to save the world. He moved in with what he calls his radical community, a group that shares both an ideology of complete dissatisfaction with existing society due to its oppressive nature and desire to radically destroy or alter society. Connor found a community that lived and breathed concepts like call-outs, intersectionality, cultural appropriation, trigger warnings, safe spaces, privilege theory, and rape culture. Thankfully, after finding himself exhausted and hating humanity, Barnes found freedom. His advice to anyone still swept up in far-left groups is simple. Flee the cult. Now, I imagine very few of us here are in danger of joining neo-Nazi groups or Antifa groups. I hope that's not you this morning. Uh, but all of us can probably recognize the impulse to divide into groups, to think in us versus them kinds of ways. So here's where we're going this morning. We're going to talk about individualism, how it leads to tribalism, and finally, how the way of Jesus is so much better than both. So first, individualism. We're in a series called Cross Culture, Biblical uh, Clarity and Cultural Chaos. And one of the reasons for this chaos is our culture is really fragmented. It's like when you drop a glass of water on the, the floor. Society is shattered into countless pieces. And there seems to be less and less holding us together. We used to all watch the same TV shows at the same time, listen to the same songs on the radio at the same time, uh, but now no longer. We're divided into as many pieces as there are people. And one of the reasons for this, and we've talked about this a lot as a church, is individualism. The idea that the individual preference and choice reigns supreme. That we should live with as few boundaries and restraints as possible. That everyone should be able to do whatever they want as long as it doesn't harm others. Your life is your own. You do you. Follow your heart. Choose your own adventure. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And we've been kind of marinated in this ideology for decades, even centuries in America. But a very interesting thing happens or can happen when we go too far down this path of individualism, radical individualism. See, being all alone, radical individualism, is a lonely, empty, and scary place to be. And so what we do is revert back to an ancient instinct. When we're alone, when we're aimless, when we're afraid, we band together. We find a group, a tribe. So you see, radical individualism leads to tribalism. Philosopher and Holocaust survivor Hannah Arndt noticed this years ago. She studied the lives of people who had become political fanatics and found two things in common with all these people. Two things. Loneliness and spiritual emptiness. Loneliness and spiritual emptiness. 
it turns out that I'm just going to be my authentic self is not sustainable. And so as these political fanatics demonstrate, we gravitate towards something that's bigger than just me. And it's not just individualism. Think about things like consumerism. Uh, life is about consumption, the next purchase, the next product, the next Netflix series. Or hedonism, life is about pleasure, the next drink, the next meal, the next vacation, the next sexual experience. You see, tribalism is evidence that these things do not meet our deeper needs. When Russia invaded Ukraine a few months ago, lots of experts were very confused. It didn't make any rational sense. And so in trying to understand some of these things, there's a quote by George Orwell, he wrote 1984, that keeps resurfacing, and it kind of speaks to our Western misunderstanding. In this quote, Orwell is talking about Hitler. He says this, Hitler has grasped the falsity of the hedonistic attitude to life. Nearly all Western thought since the last war, certainly all progressive thought, has assumed that human beings desire nothing beyond ease, security, and avoidance of pain. In such a view of life, there is no room, for instance, for patriotism and the military virtues. Hitler, because in his own joyless mind, he feels it with exceptional strength, Hitler knows that human beings don't only want comfort, safety, short working hours, hygiene, birth control, and in general, common sense. Hitler knows that humans, at least intermittently, want struggle and self-sacrifice. Whereas socialism and even capitalism in a grudging way have said to people, I offer you a good time. Hitler has said to them, I offer you struggle, danger, and death. And as a result, a whole nation flings itself at his feet. So what he's saying is Hitler understood something about humans that we Westerners so often don't. Putin too. Why would Putin invade Ukraine even at great cost and loss? See, both men understood in a twisted way that we humans exist for something bigger than ourselves. That we exist for something bigger than comfort and pleasure and personal happiness. We were made for something significant, built to belong. Now, tragically, Hitler and others manipulated that God-given impulse to devastating ends. Now, maybe we should actually define tribalism. Uh, one definition is this, the behavior and attitudes that stem from strong loyalty to one's own tribe, group, political party, or church. Now, of course, by this definition, tribalism or strong loyalty isn't always a bad thing. Uh, these are powerful forces. Uh, they can be used for great good or great evil. But strong loyalty becomes problematic when it becomes all-consuming, idolatrous. When we idolize, we demonize. Uh, we idolize our tribe, we demonize those outside of it. You'll do anything for the team, including crossing lines and boundaries that you would normally never cross. And this all-consuming loyalty actually makes us so much dumber uh, because we get into echo chambers we're only around people who think like us. We all sound the same. And so our thinking isn't challenged by those outside the tribe. That we get dumber, we get stupider. David Brooks defines tribalism more negatively in contrast with community. He says this, tribalism seems like a way to restore the bonds of community. Uh, it certainly does bind people together. But he, he says it's actually the dark twin of community. See, community is a connection based on mutual affection. Tribalism is a connection based on mutual hatred. Community based on common humanity, tribalism on a common foe. So in other words, what is the glue that holds a group together? Is it anxiety and animosity or affection? Is it anxiety or charity, resentment or curiosity? And it won't take 30 seconds in a group to know the answer to that question. What holds this group together? See, tribalism, if you're taking notes, is a mutual hostility. We're brought together by what we're against, by what we hate, by what we fight. What are some examples of tribalism? We might think of racial tribalism, hostility based on skin color classifying and judging people based on race. 
We see tribalism in the attempt to divide us into oppressed and oppressor groups based on skin color or gender or economic status. Uh, if you're a rich, white, heterosexual Christian male, you must be like this. Uh, if you're a Native American lesbian, you must be like this, right? We're dividing people up. We strangely see tribalism in sports. Now there's of course good fun trash talk that we all engage in, but then there's verbal abuse or yelling at the ref in your kid's soccer game. Uh, or uh, sometimes diehard fans beat up opposing fans. You heard about this? People putting people into comas at 49er games. And then there's religious tribalism. We never see that at church, right? Characterized by lots of us versus them language. Famous for what we're against. Lots of exclusion, a sense of superiority, spiritual pride, condescension, contempt, comparison with the culture and other Christians. Uh, think of all the heresy hunting blogs and YouTube videos that you, your friends send to, you, your, to your email. Paul dealt with this all the way back in Corinth. 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 1 11 says, for it's been reported to me about you, my brothers and sisters, by members of Chloe's people, there is a rivalry among you. What I'm saying is this, one of you says, yeah, I belong to Paul or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, Peter, or I belong to Christ. Is Christ divided? So they're saying, hey, I'm this kind of Christian, not that kind of Christian. Uh, I follow this Christian leader, not that leader. But I think the most prominent tribalism today is partisan tribalism. R right versus left. Team red versus team blue. Conservative versus progressive. A blind loyalty to my team, a complete hostility towards the other team. And we always assume the worst about them, they're bad people, and the best about us, that we're the good guys and we're well-intentioned. And I think this is the kind of tribalism that most concerns me as a pastor. Uh, did you know there's research indicating that many people are no longer choosing their political views based on their church, they're rather choosing their church based on their political views? Politics is shaping faith and not the other way around. So many people the last couple of years have traded years of history with their home church to go somewhere that's more aligned with their view on the pandemic or masks or vaccines or Trump or the election. Of course, it's not wrong to participate politically, have strong opinions. We should, we can, but when we're more passionate about politics than Jesus, when we're getting bitter over this stuff, when we're using it as an excuse to not love our neighbor or brother or sister in Christ, when we give up years of history for this, we're falling prey to tribalism. What's underneath tribalism and its hostility? I think at least two things. One would be a kind of self-righteousness. We are better than thee. Our tribe is superior to your tribe. It's like that story that Jesus tells about the Pharisee and the tax collector representing two groups of people. Uh, Luke 18, 9, to some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. Notice that the Pharisee's prayer drips with tribal, self-righteous animosity. God, thank you that I'm not like them or them or them or them. Nice prayer. On Digging Deeper a couple weeks ago, Tim asked us a really interesting question. He asked us how our view on sexuality has changed over the last 15 years. And one of the things I recognize about myself is that while my doctrinal position hasn't changed, I still believe the same things that I did 15 years ago about sexuality. What has changed is a greater and greater awareness of my self-righteousness and sense of superiority. How I classified and judged and thought I was superior to those of a different sexual ethic. I kind of cringe at the jokes I used to tell or jokes I used to laugh at, right? I hope those things have changed, not my doctrine, but my posture. So self-righteousness is behind tribalism, but I think there's something deeper than self-righteousness. 
I'm not a counselor, but we could ask Matt in the back there. He's a counselor here in town. And, uh, I bet the counselors here could help us understand how someone who's extremely self-righteous, prideful, arrogant, looks down on others, how they may be projecting that out of a deep insecurity. In other words, I think the root of tribalism, we alluded to this earlier, is fear. Fear. I'm in danger. I need the strength and security of this tribe. There's strength in numbers. We can fight together. Tribes band together when there's a threat or perceived threat. And this is one of the dirty little secrets of politics and partisanship. Both sides benefit by always thinking they're losing. You got to always be losing. If you're the NRA, you think everyone's coming for your guns. If you support uh, more gun restrictions, you think the NRA runs the world. See, the right and the left are constantly projecting losing status to keep you motivated, to keep you voting, to keep you scared. So to review, we've been brought up in individualism, which has led people into tribalism, unified by a common hostility, motivated by fear, now, wouldn't it be really nice if Jesus provided us with some resources to deal with fear? Wouldn't that be really nice? That'd be, that, that'd be really something, wouldn't it? See, the better way of Jesus is community, of course. Now, the fact that we're built to belong shouldn't surprise us as people of the book. What did God say from the very beginning? Genesis 2.18, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. We were not made for radical individualism, God made us for community. Not me, but we. And this we should not be drawn together primarily by fear, hostility, or anxiety. Like David Brooks said, this we should be drawn together by something else. What's that? C.S. Lewis says that friendship starts when one person says to another, wait, what? You too? I thought I was the only one. Friendship starts when one person says to another, what, you too? I thought I was the only one. And I think we could say the same thing about community. Community, in contrast to tribe, is drawn together not by fear, but fascination. Not by anger or anxiety, but by affection. So if you're taking notes, community is mutual affection. And this brings unity in Christ and charity towards those outside of Christ. So first, unity in Christ. In Colossians 3, Paul tells his friends in Colossae what a Jesus community, the, sh the church, should look like. And as I read the scripture, remember that the yous are plural yous, y'alls. I might even say it a few times just to ingrain this in our head. He's speaking to the community. Colossians 3, verse 1. Since then, y'all have been raised with Christ. Set y'all's hearts on things above. Our Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set you're all, you're, your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you all died and all your lives are now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then y'all will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to all of your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these way, ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. So to summarize this part, we're to set our minds on eternal instead of earthly things, which involves, of course, turning from sexual sin, turning from greed, but it also involves casting off anger and hatred and evil speech, slanderous speech. In Christ, there are no longer any more tribal divisions, no more Jew or Greek. So Paul continues, what do we replace that junk with? The anger and the lying and stuff, verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you have grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. 
Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. So verse 14 says the, that, that love is the perfect bond of unity. Love. It's, it's the gorilla glue of community. You ever get that gorilla glue on your fingers? Anyone ever done that? Yeah, it's, it's a disaster. It's not pretty because that glue is so strong. I heard last night at a wedding that love is patient and kind. That love doesn't envy or boast. That love isn't proud or rude or self-seeking. That love isn't easily angered. That love keeps no record of wrong. Doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. And Jesus says the world will know us, not by our doctrine, not by our debates, not by our Facebook posts, but by the way we love other Christians. The way we care for one another, the way we talk about each other, the way we honor each other. And this love is incompatible with fear. It's like oil and water, like light and darkness, like pineapple on pizza, right? These things just do not go together. Love and fear doesn't go together. Paul tells us in 1 John 4.18, there is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. We love because he first loved us. So when we both recognize the love of Christ for us, fear is driven out. It doesn't really matter our past or our position or how we vote. Our community should be caught up in mutual fascination and affection for Jesus. Maybe there's people here that you would never normally see, you'd never normally interact with, you wouldn't be friends, you'd never hang out. But because you both are just mutually fascinated by Jesus, you're here, right? You're drawn together. What, you too? I thought I was the only one. I thought I was the only one. And Jesus' love for us gives us new resources to love and not fear those outside of our tribe. This is charity towards outsiders. See, our master taught us in Matthew 5, 43, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your father in heaven. For he causes his son to rise on the evil and good. Really hot sun today, right? And he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors and sinners do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. What's this being perfect business? Isn't that impossible? Uh, a better translation of this word perfect is probably uh, be complete, be mature in this. In what? In loving our enemies and in praying for those who persecute us like Jesus did. Okay. Uh, I should treat outsiders like God treated me as an outsider. Uh, he gives even his enemies countless gifts every single day. And so I wonder, when was the last time you prayed for an enemy? A, a political opposite. Someone who infuriates you. Uh, it's amazing how God will soften our hearts as we be begin to do this. To do what he asked of us and to pray for uh, our enemies, to pray for those who are different from us. Yes, tell the truth. Yes, argue for justice. Love doesn't mean we accept everything about everyone, but I need to love my enemies and treat them as God in Christ loved and treated me. So worship team, would you guys come on back up? And we're gonna sing two more songs together, but I have a practical consideration for you this week. Uh, I've said before, I think your life and your faith will generally be better the less media you consume. <laughs> I stand by that. Amen, Kent. <laughs> but if you do engage with the news this week, uh, find one thing about your tribe, the tribe that you most naturally side with, your team, if you will. Find one thing in your tribe that is not in alignment with the way of Jesus. It might be a policy. It might be a posture. It might be a lack of love for neighbor. But it's just getting in the habit of practicing uh, that discernment, discerning the way of Jesus from the way of the tribe, from the way of this world. You guys think you can do that? Maybe, maybe three of you. Okay, we'll see.
And one more thing, just notice how easy it is to judge people by the group that they belong to. Uh, they said this, they must mean that. They look this way. They wore that t-shirt. They must uh, believe this. It is very us and them kinds of thinking. Instead, hey, tell me a little bit about your story. What's that tattoo about? Tell me about it. Last scripture here, Revelation 5, 9. We read this in heaven and it's referring to us, the saints. All of us are saints in Christ. It says, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy, Jesus, to take the scroll and open its seals understand the mystery of the future because you were slain and with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on earth. See, by his death, Jesus purchased one people from every tribe. In the new creation, there won't be any more tribalism. There won't be any more anger or anxiety or hostility or fear we'll be singing one song. You are worthy, Jesus. We will together and forever be fascinated by Jesus. Let's pray. Father, would you forgive us for the ways we so easily uh, are brought together by anger and animosity and fear and the things that that often causes us to do. God, I pray that we would be people of, of unity in the body of Christ in charity towards those outside of the body. Lord, there'd be something distinct and unique. Lord, you said the whole world would know that we are Christians by not the way we take a stand, but by the way we love one another. So let that be the primary apologetic, the primary preaching that we do, uh, loving everyone like you loved us. In Jesus' name, amen.